Buonasera a tutti, welcome everybody at the Italian Cultural Institute. Uh, tonight we will have a conversation between the Italian pianist Beatrice Rana and Harvey Sachs, uh, that you know very well, he, he was here at the Institute many times, um, on the occasion of the concert, piano recital at Carnegie Hall, uh, that, uh, but Beatrice uh, will play tomorrow. Um, I asked Beatrice to come and I want to thank her to be here uh, because uh, also this year we have only three Italian musicians at, in, in the Carnegie Hall uh, season. One is Maurizio Pollini, who came every every year. One is Gian Andrea Noseda, uh, who will conduct the National Symphony Orchestra, and the third is Beatrice Rana. The, uh, <laughs> and Beatrice not only has a concert tomorrow, but uh, she will uh, back here in June for a concert with Philadelphia Orchestra uh, playing the third concert uh, of Prokofiev's. So, for me, it, it, this is enough uh, to, to explain why, why we uh, invited her. Uh, Beatrice Rana, at 24, has already um, enticed the admiration of the international classical music world and won the interest of music association, conductors, critics, and audiences around the world. Uh, he performed in the most prestigious concert hall and festival, and he, she collaborates with conductors such as Riccardo Chailly and Antonio Pappano, Yannick Nese Seguin, uh, who will conduct the um, Philadelphia Orchestra, Fabio Luisi, Yuri Temirkanov, Gian Andrea Nozeda, and, and Zubi Med, and many others, but I choose some of them. Um, I want to, to remember also uh, two great recordings she did for Warner Classics, uh, the Variazioni Goldberg by Bach, and the piano concert number two uh, of Prokofiev, uh, and um, piano concert number one by Tchaikovsky with Antonio Pampano and Orchestra dell'Accademia Nazionale di Santa Cecilia. I think this is enough to introduce her, so I leave the floor to Herbie Sachs and Beatrice Ciran. Thank you, and welcome. I'm actually, I would like to begin with music. I'd like to start with the uh, Prokofiev, a little excerpt from the Prokofiev Third Piano Concerto. Um, that was recorded in, I think, in uh, Paris. Yes, yes, last year. Last year with uh, Manuel Crivin and the Orchestre Nationale de France, right? From last year. Just to give you an example of the fantastic technique. <laughs> Thank you. 
magnificent. It looks easy, but it's not, believe me. <laughs> so I wanted to begin, of course, at the beginning and ask a bit about your background. Um, Beatrice's parents are here this evening, yeah. and she began her studies, I believe, with them, no? Oh, actually not. No. Uh, so uh, both my parents are pianists, but um, they never wanted to be my teachers. So uh, I started very early, but in a musical school. And uh, where it was in Lecce, uh, in my hometown, which is in the high hill of the boot. And um, it was a musical school that didn't have kind of um, academic approach. It was more of like a game. Uh, just to play together with the other kids, sing uh, together, and getting you know familiar with the keyboard and with music. Starting at what age? Three. I, w I was three years old. Yes, so that's why it wasn't academic. <laughs> and um, later on, I, uh, I, you know, I realized that I really liked piano, and uh, I wanted to to be more serious with that. So I started uh, at six, around six, I started with individual lessons, and eventually at nine, I got in the conservatory. Uh, in Lecce. In Lecce for just one year, and then when I was 10 years old, I moved uh, to, I mean, uh, just as a conservatory, I moved to, to Monopoly, uh, studying with Benedetto Lupo. And uh, in, at that moment, things became really serious because uh, finally I could study with a, a person that had an international career, uh, so who was walking every night on a great stage and um, yeah, that was really my first life-changing experience because uh, also he treated me as an adult from the very first moment. And uh, of course I was suffering a bit because everyone was treating me like a child as I was. <laughs> but he, he thought that in order to be a good musician and a good professional musician, uh, th there was no matter of age. And that was uh, a bit shocking at first. And how long did you study with him? Uh, basically, I consider myself still his student. <laughs> I officially finished uh, my lessons with him uh, two years ago. Um, I had a kind of a break when I was 18 because I finished my studies at the conservatory when I was 18, uh, together with the high school, and he really wanted me to go abroad and study with some, someone else, um, which I think uh, was such a clever and wise choice. Usually uh, teachers tend to be very possessive, and uh, I don't know, it's, uh, I consider really uh, this uh, as an act of generosity to me, and. Uh, to my really studying career. And so that's why I moved to Germany. And I have been living there for four years, studying with Arivardi. And after those four years, I realized that Germany wasn't my place. <laughs> and I came back to, to Italy. And uh, at that p point, it just uh, got a new position in Rome. And I decided I would apply in Rome because I wanted to have still some lessons with him. and. Uh, yeah, he's not just a teacher, I consider really him as a, my mentor. Mm -hmm. And where in Germany were you? I was in Hanover, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, uh, not a very nice city, <laughs> but um, uh, has a great school, music school. Uh, especially at the time when I was in Hanover, it was really a referral point for all pianists. So. I remember getting at the school, you know, I was coming from a very tiny conservatory of Monopoly. Uh, of course, my teacher was great, but uh, the other people around weren't as motivated as I was. And then I arrived in uh, Hanover and I found all these young and amazing pianists. And uh, somehow it was like walking in a zoo because <laughs> everyone was so mm, special in something, like people that would sight read a uh, contemporary piece or like Prokofiev's second concerto, like, like this. And uh, so that was a huge motivation for me. It was 
more stimulating than daunting, right? <laughs> yes. And yeah, I think that uh, that kind of uh, comparison with the other was a very positive one. And uh, because, you know, in, in a small conservatory as Monopoly, it was very easy <laughs> to be considered uh, the best. And uh, at that point, you know, you had to, you had so many other persons with such special gifts and uh, it was very inspiring. Also, people really uh, so devoted to music. Uh, of course, there was also the negative side because when there is such a competitive environment, that can be also quite demanding on the psychological level. Um, it can that be poisonous sometimes too. It yes. It can be very difficult. Yeah. Uh, when it you're young especially. I was very lucky because I grew up with my family until I was 18 years old, which was not the case of many other students in that school. Usually, especially Asian students, they go to like schools for gifted uh, musicians uh, at a very early age, so they didn't grow up with families, and I think that makes a uh, huge difference uh, because they sometimes uh, it's very easy to feel the responsibility of such a gift, and uh, it's also very difficult to develop this responsibility in a positive way. So. Um, uh, I think that uh, to keep a healthy um, approach to music was very uh, difficult, but at the same time, it was still very inspiring to see all these people so diverse and uh, coming from all over the world, just you know, there for for music. And mm, I learned a lot. By the way, how did you learn to speak English so well? <laughs> yes, <laughs> outstanding. I would say. How did you learn? Did you study English? I promise I'm Italian. <laughs> 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 no, I uh, uh, I was very. Um, I, I remember my first time in the U.S. and um, I was 15 at that time, and um, my English was the English that I learned at school, so very bad. And uh, I arrived uh, there and uh, I couldn't speak any single word and for like a couple of days. And then uh, the third day I, you know, I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, okay, you came here to do your job, now go and speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you, uh, you, know, you were in Texas for a while and we don't think that they really speak English in <laughs> Texas. <either. laughs> Something vaguely resembling. Yeah, that, was, that was hard, yes. <laughs> Do you speak German also from your I years learned in? German. Uh, unfortunately, I don't speak it uh, very well. I was used to speak uh, better German before, but um, I never enjoyed practicing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would like to uh, show another example or two. Um, Beatrice recorded the Goldberg variations, as was mentioned, for Warner Classics. And there are a couple of cuts from the recording sessions that I'd like to uh, show now.
feel particularly close to Bach? Um, yes, I, um, I always had a very um, special relationship with, Bach, with Bach's music. Um, when I was in conservatory and I was very young, uh, my teacher just asked me, you know, every lesson to, you know, to play for her um, some inventions or, you know, the three parts uh, inventions or the, the suite. And then I, I did um, a recital in Venice. Uh, it was a complete Bach recital. I was um, 10 years old and uh, uh, there was also the aria from the Goldberg. And after this recital, um, I went to, it was the first year that I was studying with uh, Benedetto Lupo. And he uh, told me, you know, as we can do as a game, uh, you bring to every lesson one variation from the Goldberg. And um, so I did. And um, it was a game. So of course I wasn't supposed to play the Goldberg at such an early age. But somehow this score always remained on the piano for uh, for such a long time because then when I was uh, around 15, 16, my teacher said, oh, it would be nice if you could go back to the Goldberg. And I was a bit intimidated. Uh, so I, I was I was saying, no, please, it's, it's too early. And then again, later on, I said, maybe it could be time, but still I wasn't feeling ready. And finally, um, Basically, when uh, when I understood that I was done with competitions, uh, that I didn't have to go through <laughs> that nightmare anymore, uh, I asked uh, myself, what uh, do I really want to do? Because uh, until that moment, I had repertoire uh, requirements. And uh, I said, okay, I want to go back to Bach, and I really want to do the Goldberg. Uh, so I did some like s mm, few years of preparation playing the, the, mm, the partitas, in public, and finally I arrived to the Goldberg. And that was um, uh, really the fulfillment of a dream, because um, a, as a musician and as a pianist, to have to experience such a music on stage, and also in, in the recording process, but mostly on stage in front of the audience, is um, amazing really. Uh, playing the Goldberg really changed my life as a musician. What do you think when you hear yourself now? Do you think, oh, I would do that a little differently uh, yes. now? Uh, why did I do that? I you get know? always very nervous. <laughs> 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 I, I never dare to listen again to my recording of the Goldberg. So, um, uh, I don't know. I, it's a very mixed feeling because when, when you record, uh, you want the recording to be perfect. And... Uh, the next day you already change ideas. Mm. So it's like a photo of that moment. And uh, of course I would like to change many things now, mm. but I, um, the good thing is that I can recognize myself. Um, so it's, it's okay. Well, that's the mark of a serious musician, you know. The not so serious ones love whatever it is that they've just done. <laughs> <laughs> and the serious ones, as soon as it's over, they think, why did I do this and why did I do that? Um, what about, you mentioned competitions, which have played an important part in your career, the, the Clyburn in particular. Are they good? Are they bad? I mean, they're, I guess you could say they're good when you win and they're not good when you don't <laughs> win. I would say they are good for me because otherwise I wouldn't be here tonight. So, um, uh, most of the things, basically everything happened because I went through the competition process. And um, I was very lucky because I, I didn't do many competitions. Basically, the only two international ones that I did were Montreal and the Van Clyburn. And um, well, when I was younger, I enjoyed very much competing because um, I have to admit I, I am a competitive person. So I, I enjoyed very much that adrenaline in competitions. Uh, and I enjoyed very much until when I didn't have, I didn't feel expectations from the others. And that was so until the Montreal competition. Because I did the Montreal competition when I, it was my first international uh, competition. And, uh, you know, just to be admitted in the 30 competitors was um, an amazing honor. So How I, old were you? I was 18. It was during my last year of high school. 
And, uh, you know, I left for Canada. I was so happy to, to, to make a trip to Canada. I even didn't have the dress for the final. So um, I basically I enjoyed very much the experience there. And uh, I won it. So, I, mm, of course, that was already a very important step because after that I got in, a, in an agency in Europe. I recorded the first CD. I started to, make con to do concerts. So I started to experience the life as a pianist. And two years later, I decided to apply for the Clyburn competition. And that was very, very different because uh, at that time I had a lot of expectations both from myself, because I knew what a competition was uh, and uh, I wasn't going there just to compete. Uh, I wanted to, to get something from the competition. Um, and also expectations from the audience, because uh, it had such a huge coverage of media and uh, photos and videos everywhere, following you everywhere. And it was so difficult to concentrate. And uh, I think I lost a lot of weight during the competition, uh, despite the Texan food. And <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, when it was over, uh, I, I felt very lucky that I got a prize and uh, that I didn't have to do competitions anymore because I was very happy with, uh, with that silver medal. And um, basically, I got what I wanted, which, uh, which was uh, playing in the US. So, because I never played in the US before. So, um, so if you ask me, are competitions good or not? It's, uh, for me, they were good because they gave me the opportunity to become a pianist. And uh, I wouldn't be here otherwise. Uh, but they can be very dangerous, uh, psychologically speaking, because they, uh, there is such a huge amount of pressure and um, uh, I was very lucky because I, I didn't have to compete in many of them before getting a prize. So uh, I know some other incredibly talented people that had to, to do many before winning one prize and uh, that must be very tiring. I knew a violin teacher who used to tell his students, uh, I if you want to enter a competition, don't tell me. Only tell me if you win. <laughs> because it doesn't matter if you enter a competition and you lose, it doesn't matter. But if you win, it does matter. Well, so. but the, the problem also is that when you prepare for a competition, the teacher gets so nervous. I remember like well, preparing for the Clyburn and I was in Hanover. Uh, studying with Arivardi, and uh, the lessons with him were always incredibly good. Like, he is the most relaxed person, working very hard, but always in a very positive way. And the only time I had a very bad lesson was right before the competition. And uh, I was like, come on, like, did, did I play so bad? I, I was thinking, because it was in, like, I was shocked. And then I realized, maybe, maybe he's nervous too. <laughs> Um, we talked about Bach. Are there other composers to, with whom you feel, you know, a special sort of uh, connection? Um, that's difficult to say. Um, basically, all the composers that I bring on stage, and especially the pieces that I want to play publicly, I feel very close. Um, probably, as a composer, I always um, liked very much Schumann. Um, I don't. I don't know why. I mean, uh, certainly because of the, of course, of the music, I, and uh, for his um, symphonic and uh, approach to, to, to the piano, and uh, you know, uh, also his life. Like, what an amazing man! And uh, also his. I have to say that probably there is also the influence of his love story with Clara who was the, really the first concert pianist, female concert pianist in uh, modern times. So, uh, I don't know, everything all together, and the thing that he was so supportive with uh, other composers like Mendelssohn, uh, if you read the diaries, it's amazing to see how much music uh, would be played at their house, 
and traveling, the traveling life, touring life of the wife, and... Uh, and all those children. All those children, yes. <laughs> and one of, for example, one of the most moving uh, moments of those diaries for me is the birth of the first symphonies, the first symphony and the first daughter, and uh, all together. And uh, so I, I always felt um, very close to that, uh, to that family, let's say. And um, of course, I love playing Schumann on stage, but that's not the only composer. I mean, I, I do love Ravel very much, for example, or Prokofiev. Or, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't feel very fair if I name just these ones. <laughs> Well, in fact, uh, I think we're going to hear you now playing some Debussy, the Toccata, which is a terribly difficult piece. in Paris. Huh? Yes. yes, that one was in Paris. Yes. Yeah. Um, wondering, uh, pianists past and present that you particularly admire, you know, historic 
pianists or recent past or yeah um my first idol uh was Martha Argerich and um i don't know if this was because she um is a woman now that everything is so you know <laughs> uh politically used uh but i i don't think it's because of that i think it's because because his um her uh musicality and her approach to to music like her being a lioness uh uh taking the risk uh for music sometimes also in very strange ways but you know just uh giving all herself uh in the moment that i admire very much from the very first moment and uh, i always took her as an example um of really being on stage in that way and uh, later on of course i discovered uh, uh the world of so many pianists of the past and uh, that was uh, incredible because ev everyone has something to say so special and um i loved very much horovitz i Hara, i loved arao i love um clara askil richter gilels and uh, i i don't know it's uh, in the past uh, we were so lucky uh, to have all of these amazing people and um another uh, well um the thing is that sometimes i regret very much not to have listened to these people live because um for an example uh for example i i take my experience with with zimmerman i i knew his recordings and um of course i liked them but was never so much in love and then finally zimmerman came to lecce to my hometown uh, i don't know why honestly <laughs> but he did and uh i was 15 at that time and uh, finally i heard him live and i was shocked i i became fun from the very first moment because he, his way of playing was so bold and so it was just incredible musicianship and great charisma and i couldn't feel that kind of charisma on cd and i wonder uh if there is really one of my biggest regrets uh is uh not having heard live uh, michelangeli and uh, especially his way of playing french music i would have loved to to listen to his debut live uh It's because some of the recordings sound a, a bit cold no yeah well i had a very nice talk with um, his tuner uh, angelo fabrini uh, in italy and um, he was telling me that um, recording one of his debut cds he really wanted the microphones in the piano and everyone was telling him but this is this this is not sounding very beautiful like your sound is way more beautiful and he wouldn't like that he wanted really the precision of microphones being next to the keyboard and to the action uh, so that's why i i think that what we have now it's is very very different from what people uh, in the hall listened at that time you mentioned zimmerman uh, you know he doesn't play in the united states anymore because he had I trouble know. with uh, customs and immigration mm. here um but he's he is a wonderful wonderful artist um how about the whole process of you know concertizing and touring and all that and uh, when you mentioned marta agrich and the sort of the the demonstration of you know sang froid sangue freddo <laughs> that that she uh she gives when when she performs and i i must say i see that in you too this it, it may not be what you're actually feeling but what comes across is somebody who is very determined and goes right to the to the task i think a very good combination of sangue freddo e caldo is needed <laughs> because I'll of go for the interpretation <laughs> for the actual play no because of course you need you need that uh huge determination and concentration to go on stage and uh one of the the thing that my teacher lupo was telling me the most is that you have to you know get people moved but you don't have to get moved yourself you're just 
an instrument. And uh, of course, in order to do that, you need a huge amount of concentration. And that's on stage, but the life of being a concert pianist is much more than that. It's traveling uh, with uh, all the sometimes travel difficulties as I had two days ago. And um, also getting to know every time new places, new people, new cultures. New piano. Uh, new piano. For instance, coming to the US is not that easy sometimes because the pianos in the US are very different from the European ones. And um, so all of that, but at the same time, you need sangue caldo because, uh, you know, I mean, you, of course, you are an instrument, but uh, you have to tell a story. I mean, you, you cannot just do your job. It's not a job. And, uh, you know, sometimes I, I even ask myself, why do I get so nervous before going on stage? Because after all, I'm, I'm not a doctor. No one is going to die if I, if I do bad my job. And, uh, but uh, I, for me, it's a question of life. Because if I'm not honest, if I don't give uh, like 100% of myself or 200% of myself every night, I feel like a, not a very honest artist and... Um, uh, of course, it's normal also to make mistakes, but it's always the uh, reason why you made those mistakes. If you, if you make those mistakes for a good purpose, like making music, then it's fine. And uh, sometimes, you know, uh, making music is not that easy. <laughs> right. I always tell the story of uh, <clears throat> the great cellist Gregor Piatigorsky, who was playing... Uh, concerto with Toscanini and the uh, New York Philharmonic in the 30s. And he wrote in his memoir how he was, before going on stage at Carnegie Hall, uh, you know, he was practicing in Tuscany, he was pacing back and forth very nervously, as always. And he kept saying, we're no good, we're no good, <laughs> we're no good. And Piatigorsky said, please, maestro, I'm so nervous already. You're making me wish I, wish I had died as a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and Tuscany is walking back and forth. We're no good, we're no good. But as they're about to go on stage, he turns to him and says, but the others are worse. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, I mean, I think uh, nervousness is, every serious artist feels that. Rubinstein used to say, you know, uh, the price I pay for my wonderful life is having to walk on stage at 8.30. <laughs> You know, every evening. Yeah, you know, like uh, last week I was in Boston, playing uh, in Boston, and you know, I arrived backstage. They, they knock at my door, so I go backstage, and there is always the announcement like uh, not taking photographs and videos, blah, blah, blah. And when the announcement was going to finish, there was the guy backstage saying, okay, 10 seconds. Like to have someone saying, 10 seconds just before going on stage is like that kind of sentence that you should never say. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah. So, but... Um, but you survive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as I get on the piano bench, it's fine. But right. those... Yeah. It, there is so much going on in the head before. And, um, of course, uh, we are also human beings. So, every night is different. Right. Yeah, a friend of mine who was teaching a course on memorization techniques for musicians asked, uh, we have a very, Andras Schiff, you know, pianist, is a very good friend, old friend, and uh, she asked him, how do you memorize? And he said, I don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, because... Well, but he's, I mean... He's he has no problem. Exactly, he has and no problems at all. Like, right. one of the biggest memory, I think, amazing, in, in amazing. the world. But he, he will not discuss <laughs> how he memorizes. It's a mystery, you know. Um, yeah, well, you already, I was going to ask you about the life of a uh, traveling virtuoso, but you already, we already I'm not a virtuoso that. anyway. Well, like, uh, it took me three weeks <laughs> to recover from jet lag. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's very modest of you to say that. Well, I think... Uh, we can, in a minute, we'll open it up to uh, questions. But first, let's hear, I want you to hear uh, the uh, last part of the last movement of the Schumann Piano Concerto that was uh, recorded last year at the Royal Albert Hall.
the proms in London with the BBC Symphony and Andrew Davis conducting, since you mentioned Schumann.
Okay. Um, any questions? Yes. Uh, can you talk about the different experiences performing uh, as part of an ensemble with other musicians or an orchestra and your solo performance? Of course. I mean, um, thank you for asking that because it's. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, of course, like now I am on a tour with a solo recital and uh, that's a very intense experience because um, being on stage for the whole time alone is um, of course a huge amount of responsibility, uh, but at the same time uh, also a huge privilege because um, it's, uh, it's very tiring, of course. It's uh, sometimes exhausting to play a recital, but uh, to have the stage for you and really be the owner of your own space and time is uh, something absolutely special and um, somehow you don't have to to find compromise with anyone if you you know you have your own musical ideas and you can realize that that's the advantage but also the disadvantage because there is no one telling you if you're doing a good thing or not and uh, playing with other musicians, of course, um, makes this problem easier because when you play with someone, you're sharing your musical ideas with m more people. And uh, of course, there are more ideas uh, coming from different point of views. And um, sometimes, of course, you have to find compromise, but sometimes it's also mind opening because you know you, you perform a certain piece, for example, the Schumann Concerto is one of the hardest thing to play with a conductor and an orchestra because it's a concerto, but it's basically like chamber music. And you know, to make everyone be convinced about the same idea and to convince eventually people in the audience is uh, not an easy job. And uh, most of the time, I think this is the concerto where I found really uh, the most different ideas. Playing with an orchestra gives you a huge amount of energy because there are so many people on stage. And um, of course, for the soloist, it's quite nice because uh, it's, um, you know, the concerto was born as a general to show your virtuoso uh, abilities. And, uh, but I consider that experience as a lot of fun because uh, really the, I take so much energy from the, from the orchestra and the conductor. And uh, I, I would say it's very easy to communicate this energy to the, to the audience. Chamber music is another thing. It's more of an intimate experience. And uh, sometimes it's the most rewarding because uh, you get to share the stage with very few people. And of course, it's like a human relationship. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, uh, but it's worth trying. And um, for instance, I, I love so much uh, chamber music that I even created a festival in my hometown of chamber music. And that's also um, very um, you know, uh, refreshing because being a concert pianist means spending a lot of time alone and uh, you know giving myself that opportunity really to share music and life with other people is uh, is wonderful and um, so i i could never choose among the three of them I, I need solo i need orchestra and i need chamber music and in this way i can i can keep myself balanced and also take inspiration from one for the other so chamber music for the solo, solo for the orchestra, or and vice versa. Somebody else? Yes. Ciao, hi. I'm from Monopoly, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, three questions, more related to your I mean, relationship between your own identity and the music. The first one is related to Lupo. Lupo was a game changer for you, right? Mm -hmm together with other game changers that you had in your life. But uh, it provided great service in um, a province, in a remote province. Is that an idea that will, you know, find it uh, fascinating in the future? I'm not saying now, you just started, but in 20 years, to give back to the territory where you come from and uh, have uh, maybe other talented people, you know, discover and, uh, and uh, raise talented people like you first. 
Second, um, things got serious in the last six, seven years, as far as I understood. Um, are you still able to get friends, make friends in such a competitive environment? Some of my best friends are musicians, so I hear a lot of stories <laughs> about uh, how tough it can be. Are you still able to make friends in, uh, once you change your level and uh, you know, environment around you? Wait, or your may best maybe answer the first two questions. Yes, I was afraid to forget, actually. Or, <laughs> or your best friends are from the childhood or you know, when... Okay. You had your life in the province. So to answer to the first question, um, I would love, of course, to, to give back to this, the same gifts that I had uh, because it's, a, it's huge what I got from, from Lupo, for instance. And uh, I was very, very, very lucky to, to find in Monopoly such a small town uh, this kind of uh, teacher and education. Uh, right now, I don't feel ready to be a teacher. I think that being a teacher is much more than just spending one hour with a, with a student because I can see now the result of what he did 15 years ago. And it's much more than saying, oh, here you do diminuendo and here you do crescendo. It's not like that. It's uh, you really uh, have a person in your hands and this person trusts you and uh, you, of course, you can make mistakes, but with, it's with someone else's life that you make mistakes, so you really have to be sure that at least uh, you try to do the best. And be, uh, doing the best is thinking of what perspective the people can, can have. And I, personally speaking, I remember Lupo right after my diploma exam in Monopoly, I was 16 years old, and um, so the diploma went well. And uh, I still had th two years more to do in the high school, and he came to me and my parents and asked uh, us, so how much time left do I have with Beatrice? Do I have one year? Do I have two years? Do I have five years? Because I need to know in which dimension I have to work. And I was speechless because at that time I was 16. So like I was, I was just thinking of what doing in the night, <laughs> but not in two years or five years. And once I decided it was like two years because uh, after the high school I would have moved somewhere else. He said, okay, so now that you told me it's two years, here is the repertoire list that you learn for the next two years. And it was a huge amount of music and uh, you bring me to lesson this and this and this and we work in this direction. Of course, I was very lucky because I don't think there are many teachers that do something like this. But if I have to be a teacher, I have to be this way because I had really the best kind of education. And right now I'm not ready to do that. So that's why I do the festival because I, in the, at 26 I can bring of course, my, my joy to make music, but with friends and just to play for them and to make people of my town and my region discover all the amazing talents that I find on my way. But right now, not more than that, because uh, it would be so much responsibility. And uh, the second question is... Um, was the friends. Okay, so I was lucky or I don't know, well, I consider to be lucky to have uh, attended a high school that was um, scientific, so normal high school, not for musicians. So basically all my childhood friends are not musicians. And uh, that makes life easier. <laughs> First of all, because we can eventually meet somewhere, <laughs> because with the other musicians, you never meet anywhere else. Uh, they, they are always traveling and... Uh, it's quite difficult on the organization level and also because it's refreshing. I, um, I get to spend like 90% of my time with musicians and of course I enjoy very much. Uh, but I also like to know what my friends are doing and most of them are engineers or doctors and um, I think it's, uh, it's very nice. Sometimes they look at me as an alien because I'm never home but um, 
I'm also very lucky because uh, these friends are very, very close to me and um, yes, I can count on their friendship. Of course, now I make more friends uh, in different cities and that's also very nice, but yeah, like those, th those real friends are in Italy and most of them are not musicians. Okay, the last one is related to public orchestras in Italy. There is a big crisis because of budget, fiscal issues. Um, how would you uh, reform the public orchestra's framework in Italy? Um, bigger, less and bigger, consolidated, or uh, you know they have also kind of social service on the territory in, uh, in remote areas like exactly in, uh, in Lecce and so on and so forth. So would you have any idea? How so I speak of the situation that I know, for example, in Lecce. In Lecce is <laughs> disaster and uh, we don't have an orchestra anymore we don't have a opera theater anymore and that happened for different reasons uh, lack of interest from the government uh, so lack of money and funds and therefore lack of motivation in the playing of musicians so you know and no one is want, wants to go to a concert if the orchestra doesn't play well. And uh, if the orchestra doesn't play well, it means that musicians are not good enough and there is no, like, there are no people that want to get that job. There is no competition. Of course, high level orchestras, they want everyone, like, is killing to play in those orchestras. There is a great competition level. And uh, I think that the, everyone got very lazy. And uh, gradually it was, um, it's a pity because, you know, music is part of our culture and in, in Italy it's so important. Uh, I think that, first of all, there should be like two different directions. One of the, on the professional level, uh, really trying to have a good artistic result. And the other one on the social level, because we need to build the audience and the audience uh, cannot come uh, to concerts if they don't know of classical music. Classical music doesn't exist in public education and uh, this is just absurd because if you go to, sc to school, you learn literature, you learn math, you, le you learn arts, religion, everything, but you don't learn music. And uh, this is, th this, I find it crazy because of course if you don't know music, you don't even have the desire of going to a concert and then judge by yourself your, if you like it or not. Of course, I'm not saying that everyone will like classical music because it's not, uh, things, it's not a thing that fills stadiums, but it's good enough to fill a theater, I think, weekly or daily. And uh, there should be more, more investments on the education, especially on the younger generations. Agreed. <laughs> Anybody else have something that they'd like to? Yes. Oh, sorry. Ciao, Beatrice. <laughs> Ciao. Hello, I'm a friend. No, I'm, yeah, <laughs> we know from many years. Anyway, I'm a pianist myself, so I'm asking more questions for pianists, let's mm. say. So he, he sp you spoke a lot about the competition, of course, because it was so important for your life, as you mentioned. And so I wanted to know if you decide that kind of competition for a specific reason, and once you decide them, if you had a specific plan and how you prepare for them. And if you have any suggestion in general for pianists who want to try to do that kind of competitions. Okay. Um, I, was, I am one of the most planned persons <laughs> in the world. So, I, um, yes, I plan them and a uh, lot in advance. Um, there is only one thing that I didn't do and I regret very much, but you know, it just went that way because I wanted to do the Chopin competition. And when I was very young, I, you know, I printed out all the repertoire of the Chopin and uh, said like, okay, I need this and this and this to do. And, but I simply didn't do that because when I first could do that, I was too young, I was 17. And later on, the other one, I was already 22 and I did already the Clyburn, so it, it was too late, I didn't want to do that. But besides that, um, 
I did the Montreal competition as first competition on that level because, first of all, it was overseas. I didn't want to do a big competition, first of all, in my country because it would have been a lot of pressure and because I uh, just, you know, wanted to try the most far possible <laughs> and uh, because it was a competition with not a too big repertoire. So I could deal with the three rounds and three rounds is uh, it was doable at that time and uh, you know i uh, i did the montreal and it went well but i had other options of that kind of uh, level of competitions if the montreal didn't uh, wouldn't have gone well i would have done other things and uh, other competitions like with three rounds or um, like with a medium level of exposure and uh, after the Montreal, the situation was quite clear because I already got some concerts. So make, like competing in, an, uh, in another competition would have been just to, to get to, a, to the next level, let's say. So there were very few competitions that I could do at that moment. Uh, it was the Clyburn or Queen Elizabeth or Tchaikovsky, Chopin. And yeah, basically these are the four that I considered. And uh, actually, I applied both for the Clyburn and the Queen Elizabeth. The problem is that the two of them were at the same time. So I applied and I got admitted in the two of them. And uh, I was quite desperate in uh, that month because I had to decide what to do. And, uh, you know, I had like a list. Like, yes, if I go there, it's better because of this and this and this. If I go to Queen Elizabeth, it's better because for example, uh, I thought, like, going to the Queen Elizabeth, I am European, it would be great as a European t to do that. And um, the repertoire was quite um, specific, and that was uh, a challenge. But the decision why I, um, that I made, it's because I didn't like the first round of the Queen Elizabeth. I thought, you know, I am admitted to the both competition, but the Queen Elizabeth just had 15 minutes video and they decided that I was good enough to do the competition, but we are 80 competitors. And then with the first round that is very short, they decided to, uh, to cut to 24. So it was like very dangerous. With the Clyburn, I was like, yeah, they heard me live for 40 minutes. So they already know me. They already appreciate me. And we are only 30 competitors. And I have a bigger repertoire. It was double the time of, uh, of Queen Elizabeth, but I can really show myself as an artist that I want to be afterwards, so I can make my own decision of repertoire. And in a certain way, I, I could already show which kind of an artist I want to be afterwards. And I said, okay, the Clyburn reflects more my personality as a musician. And uh, that's why I decided to go to the Clyburn. So um, it was it was very hard. I um, and everyone who is close to me knows that that time was a nightmare because every time I was making a decision and then I was like, <gasps> maybe I, I did the wrong choice. <laughs> you turned out to make the right choice, obviously. Yeah, it uh, it went well, <laughs> but it was it was not uh, easy. Hi, I'm, my name is Patrizia. Um, <clears throat> I have actually two questions. The first one is, I'm Italian like you are, and I live here, but I find that in Italy there is an enormous amount of conservatory. Hence, an enormous amount of students who come out of conservatory, some medium, some very good, and some bad. But do you feel that it's a right approach to have so many people studying for them really to finish with no future, most of them? Or do you feel it would be better to have three or two, I don't know, one maybe, great conservatorio in Italy where are funneled people, talents like you, obviously at a cost of many costs, but also at not disillusioning a lot of others? So, um, first of all, there is quite 
a thing in Italy, which is Accademia di Santa Cecilia, which is the only cons uh, public institution, uh, but uh, where really uh, uh, the good ones get. And uh, but <sighs> it's a difficult question because uh, I think there are two problems. First one is not about the quantity of conservatories, but teachers. Like the, and also here, it's, uh, uh, there are different questions. First of all, the, uh, how do you get these teachers employed in the conservatory? Because now I can see that all my friends of my age, they, of my age, they would like to teach in a conservatory, and it would be great uh, as teachers, but they cannot because uh, the way of employment uh, in this conservatory is, is just crazy. And, um, you know, as people do in Germany, there should be public uh, competitions for getting that job and really uh, know who is capable of teaching in a conservatory and who is not. And speaking of teacher, then, your teacher must tell you if you can have a future in music or not. It's not the institution. Of course, the institution, public institu institution, is providing, uh, in, you know, uh, just education. But there is one. The main problem in Italy is that every teacher thinks that his student is going to become the world-class soloist. And of course, this happens to very few people. But the musical world doesn't need only that world-class musician. We need everyone, because we need musicians of the orchestra, we need em employees in the orchestra or in the public institutions, we need everyone. And I think that the main problem in Italy is that there is not, a, uh, enough, and th there is not enough stratification of that system, because only the best sur survive. But what I see, for example, in France, I started in France, and I can see that really there is space for everyone. And everyone who wants to play has a stage where he can play and where he can be listened. And uh, this is very important for musicians to be listened. In Italy there is not the opportunity. And uh, so I don't think the problem is the, uh, the number of conservatories. I think this is actually, we are very lucky to have that. And I think it, w it won't be like that for a long time, honestly. But um, the, problem com the problem comes afterwards, yeah. Thank you. And the other question, which is, I think, much more brief, is this. Whenever we, my age people, go to the concert, we find met many more of our contemporary than people your age. So it's always a mystery to me. I know a lot of young musicians, but I don't see any young audience. And I, I don't understand how it doesn't collate, because I say, but if there is young musicians, there is a point where they got interested. So even though not everyone can be a musician, but why are they not even, the rest of your generation is not even interested to attend, to look, to try? And I know you touched on it before, so I'm not saying that you... Yes, yes, uh, no, I think that it's... Uh, well, it's not a brief answer, <laughs> but uh, of course musical education picks a big role in this, but also I think uh, there must be a renovation in, uh, in the world of classical music, because especially uh, I speak uh, for Italy, because of course it's the reality that I know the most, uh, but, um, you know, there are kind of prejudice with the classical music. It's like a very detached world from uh, real life and uh, it's uh, dead music, so there is nothing to say anymore and uh, it's, um, it's also a um, social thing. So if you go to a classical music concert, you come from a wealthy family. Uh, it means that, uh, like, normal people cannot go to the concerts. So it's all these prejudice that need to be just destroyed. And uh, there is one way that I think it's working. And I know that uh, people in the classical music world 
not always appreciate, but these are the social medias. And I can really see that uh, from social media, there is a change of perspective. And myself, I mean, I don't use social media to promote myself, but it's just because I use them because I am a 26 years old girl. And as old 26 year old person, I do have Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and people of my age get to know my life. You know, I was, because I was in Italy once, and as I said, most of my friends are not musicians. So I went to my friend's house, she's an engineer, and her flatmate, she asked me, what do you do? And I said, pianist. What does that mean? Like, she didn't have in mind that being a pianist can be a profession. So it's too far away from the life of people. And uh, so, for example, it's just one small example, but using the social, I can see myself, for example, in Italy, so many people of the younger generation coming to the concert because they know, first of all, that I am a normal person that uh, with a normal life, more or less, and uh, that being a concert pianist doesn't mean uh, just being closed in a, con in a studio practicing for the whole time, but like, uh, having uh, amazing adventures around the world, doing your own laundry in, uh, in the you know in the hotel room because you're touring for a month, or uh, stuff like that. And uh, I think that at some point people realize that it's quite an interesting life and that is most of all alive. So uh, it's not like going to a museum. People think sometimes that it's really getting in a museum, but it's not. And that's what we are trying to do. So it's a long process, of course, but um, I think we should really take the responsibility of uh, taking the young generation to concerts, because otherwise we have no future. <laughs> I just want to, I want to add one thing uh, in relation to that. Um, I was talking about this with a, a friend of mine, a pianist friend, in fact. And I remember when, when we were your age, or even a little younger, uh, all of us who were studying music, we wanted to go to hear everybody who was performing. And we would, you know, whether it was when we were in New York or I grew up in Cleveland originally, we would go to the concerts and sneak in if necessary to, to be able to hear these famous artists perform. And I don't see that happening today. I don't see the music students going to but hear. But that's, that's another problem, I think. Uh, now there is YouTube, there is iTunes, oh, there true. is uh, Spotify, everything. Like, you are comfortable at home and with your own pyjama and chips and you can listen to Gillels. That's true. You, you are the same one who said to us. No, the problem is that you think that... Uh, Listening to classical music means just listening somehow to music. The life experience is something different. And uh, myself, I enjoy much more going to concerts than listening to recordings. So I think that we should put more than spotlight on the life experience and why we do that and understand then that classical music is alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it.